Okay, we're just going to give people uh, a bit of time to uh, be able to join these sessions, and you can see that, you know, yeah, they're they're actually uh, getting in now from the waiting rooms. Um, give that a few seconds. It's normally around like seventy something, at least you know for this window. Uh, so you're actually all in the round window of Map Camp. Uh, and, and this session is about uh, the green economy, um, and uh, we're going to have uh, three speakers uh, today. Okay, I think we should be okay, okay to start. So uh, hi, everyone. I'm Jen Ashley. Uh, and uh, again, you know, welcome to the round window of Map Camp. Uh, you're in the uh, green economy uh, session, and we have three speakers. Uh, great speakers today, uh, Carlotta Perez, um, Andra Sonia, did I pronounce that correctly, Andra, sorry? Yeah, it's okay. Um, and Adriana Alcacroft. So um, we're going to get started with um, Carlotta first, um, and that's going to be followed by Andra, and then Adriana will be mapping based, you know, on uh, the two uh, earlier talks. So i um, can hand it over to Carlotta now. Do I just start? Yep. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm going to share a screen. And uh, my talk is going to go beyond just the green economy, because in fact, there is no possibility of having the green economy without actually turning the digital economy into a green economy and turning them both into a fair and global golden age, which I will argue. And that is because in order to construct the future, it's very useful to have a good knowledge and understanding of the past. So what I will do today is to explain why we can be hopeful of a global golden age, but also why we should understand that it doesn't happen automatically, that it's a, it's a big task to bring it about. And it will be green and it will be fair and it will be smart in the sense of digital, but most likely it will have to be global in a, in a special sense. And we hope it will be a golden age. So with my studies of technological revolutions in the past, I can bring you an understanding and some hope for, for a better future. So the first thing is to understand that the future is not the continuation of the recent past, nor is it determined by technology. There are lots of technology determ technological determinists around who think that because artificial intelligence can do this or that, that's going to happen. No, we decide, we shape it, we design the future. It is not an automatic thing that if a technology can do something, it'll happen. We give direction to technology. And in order to understand that, history is probably the best source of criteria to guide us in the process. So I'll talk about the five technological revolutions and four golden ages that we have seen, the social shaping of technologies. I'll ask what is the nature of golden ages? And finally, why should we, would we have smart, fair, and green together? So there have been five technological revolutions in the past 240 years. The first one was the industrial revolution with machines, factories, and canals. Every revolution has a particular infrastructure. Canals was the infrastructure of the first revolution because because the infrastructures are transport infrastructures mainly, and they widen the space, they widen the market, so they allow for a big wave of growth and wealth creation based on the new technologies. The next one was the age of steam, coal, iron, and railways, railways being the internet of the time. Uh, then we have the age of steel and heavy engineering, electrical, chemical, civil, naval, at that time, we had three infrastructures, steamships, uh, transoceanic telegraph, and transcontinental railways. Then 1908, the age of the automobile, oil, plastics, and mass production, where the infrastructures that opened the markets were uh, roads, the road network, the highway network, 
airports, etc. And of course, radio and television and so on for communication. And our own age of information technology and telecommunications where the internet is the infrastructure. And we have only halfway, even though it has been so many years since the microprocessor, I hold that we are only halfway along and that we still have the second half, which is going to be hopefully a golden age. So each of these revolutions brings a techno-economic and social institutional shift. So it's not just the technologies that change, it's the whole institutional structure. The state has to change the policies, the welfare state, the, the conditions for, um, for the taxes, the you know, innovation and, and uh, investment are led by this new uh, framework that happens after. I will explain in a minute. So but what happens is that the first half is one of growing inequality, creative destruction, as Schumpeter called it. And the second half is when we get the golden ages. The historical record reveals the sequence of bubbles and golden ages. So we have bubble prosperity with increasing inequality and a golden age prosperity with win-win game on the other side. But in between, there is a post-bubble recession, political unrest, populism, the things that we are seeing now, they are, and we are just sort of hopefully at the end of this middle period and just before we can set up a golden age. So after the canal mania and the short uh, recession, there was the Great British Leap. Then the railway mania was followed by the Victorian boom. The many global booms in Australia, uh, Argentina, etc., and the US, uh, the Gilded Age, were followed by the Belle Epoque and the Progressive Era. The Roaring Twenties were followed 40 years later by the post war Golden Age. The dot com boom and global casino that we have just had could lead to a sustainable global ICT golden age? That's the question. The golden ages depend on government policy providing direction. And the post-pandemic reconstruction opens an opportunity similar to that after World War II. That's why I think we might just be here. So how about the social shaping of technologies? Well, as I said before, technology does not determine the future. All it does is to set the stage and provide the tools. So the shaping to bring about the golden age is socio-political. It is not just about the economy. It's about the institutional framework. So the outcome depends on social pressure, obviously. So civil society, political movements, business and thought leaders play a defining role in the outcome. What did we get with the mass production golden age? Employment, education, health and security based on home ownership and mass consumption. But we destroyed the environment and excluded the developing world. What could we get with the digital, digital and green golden age? All of that, but smart and green, plus meaning, creativity, social networks, lifelong learning, based on collaboration, access, rental, maintenance, recycling, and reuse, a more ethical capitalism with an improving global society flourishing on a healthy planet. Lovely dreams, perfectly viable, will they happen? This time, the transition is very deep. From energy intensity to information intensity in production and consumption, from consumerism and waste to conservation, reuse, and recycle, from resource intensive products to knowledge intensive services, from possession to access, from maximum to optimum mobility, from mostly national to increasingly local, supranational, and global governance, from home centered to network centered from aiming at passive comfort to aiming at active satisfaction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can continue that list. Many institutional innovations will be required to facilitate that transition. 
Now, what is the nature of golden ages? Well, the three periods are distinctly different. The installation is a gilded age. You know that gilded is just any base metal, but it has a nice thin cover of gold, so it shines. Well, the installation was all about financial capital and control, deregulation, unfettered markets, creative destruction, new technologies, industries, and products versus obsolete technologies, industries, and products. Easy millionaires, which end up in job losses, skills destruction, widening inequality, regional disparities, and so on. So it is a very turbulent time. How about the turning, which is where we are now? I have called it the turning point, but sometimes it lasts much longer than a point. So uh, the post-bubble recessions, risk averse finance precisely because of the hits they get with, with, uh, with the bubble collapses. But of course, if you do quantitative easing, they start trusting that they'll always be safe and therefore they're okay. Low investment nevertheless. It's basically the techies that use their money, which they don't pay in taxes, they use it for investment. Uh, we therefore have relatively feeble growth, lots of money being earned in the financial sector, but not so much, uh, not so obvious that we have proper growth across countries and the world. Social unrest, inequality, hopelessness, and therefore, xenophobia, you hate the migrants, you hate the, the Mexicans or the uh, Jews or the Muslims or whoever, whoever is around that wasn't there before, one of, not us. Populism, of course, the, the messianic leaders offer heaven and because people are angry, rightly, because they have lost their future, they have lost their hope, uh, then you get these people giving the idea that they can solve the problems which they can't. Structural unemployment, economic migrations, talk of secular stagnation, and so on. So what about the golden ages, the deployment of the whole potential? Well, it's a time for a proactive state with social consensus, production capital in control rather than finance. And finance has to innovate a lot in order to, it has to be a real, service in order to make money, creative construction, clear policy direction, dynamic markets, stable regulation, productivity increases across the board from the spread of new technology across all industries, social security measures, reduction of inequality, social stability, progressive taxation, and so on. They are very different and golden ages are the times when capitalism regains legitimacy by sharing the fruits of wealth creation. That is precisely what has made capitalism uh, legitimate. And the nature of the turning point serves as the alarm bell for government action. So that's where we are. The defining feature of golden ages is the shift from high inequality to a fairer society. If we look at the USA from 1913, which means the beginning of the mass production uh, revolution to 1918, which is midway along the information revolution, we find that the percent of declared income earned by the top 1% of taxpayers, including capital gains, this is the data from Piketty and Saez, Piketty and Saez, of course, uh, went as far as 25%, as high as 25% of incomes uh, in the roaring 20s, and now in, from the 90s and the 2000s and so on. But then in the post-war boom and the golden age of mass production, it goes down to 10. And that is exactly the phenomenon of going from installation to uh, <coughs> to golden ages, to deployment. So will we stay up there? Because that's what we did after 2008. Quantitative easing, save finance, don't save the people. So maybe we can, we can do this. It is perfectly viable. It needs to be socially and politically uh, decided. 
So would the post-COVID boom lead to a green golden age of information? It could, it should. And business counts on dynamic demand from prosperous consumers when we have golden ages. So it's good for business too. It's a positive sum game actually. Will we do it again? It is precisely from revolution to revolution and from golden age to golden age that social progress occurs in capitalism. It's like a ratchet. It goes back and destroys jobs and things, creative destruction in the installation period. Then you come to the, to the reckoning when you have the recession and you realize all the harm. You know, that's what COVID allowed us to see all the zero hours contracts and the gig economy and all these things that make insecurity for people. And, and of course, that's when we get the populists. We get the Trumps and the, and the Brexits and all these things that actually make, uh, uh, make people, you know, it, it proves that people are angry and they are right to be angry. So, but then we get the leap, we get the progress. So golden ages are essentially a positive sum game between business and society orchestrated by government. And that each productivity leap, a new layer of society is brought to the good life while some are left behind. That's how we came from the satanic mills all the way to workers owning a, a house and a car at the door and electrical appliance and the children going to university. So, but the distinctive feature of golden ages is directionality. It's precisely that the economy goes in clear directions. It is a tilting of the playing field so that all policies, taxes, subsidies, regulation, etc., point in the same directions and create dynamic demand. And that's why institutions have to change because the direction has to be different. The old directions, the old technologies, the old ways of being, the old good life is gone. We need a new good life, a new direction for businesses, new innovation, and we have the technologies with which to do it. So, um, sorry. Uh oh. And that each productivity leap, ah, I said that. So, it is a tilting of the playing field so that all policies, I said that already, I'm sorry, I got confused. This induces innovation and investment towards increasing synergy with increasing productivity and stable profitability. Now, why smart, fair and green together? What is it that makes us think that it should be that? Well, the first thing is that direction never comes out of a hat like a rabbit. It's about intensifying existing trends, solving major existing problems, and taking best advantage of the installed technologies. All this simultaneously. After the Second World War, reconstruction, unemployment, the end of military demand, and the Soviet threat led to social democratic policies to guide the existing mass production potential towards suburbanization, which meant mass consumption and Cold War production, which meant high tech, really high tech development among them, of course, uh, internet, computers and uh, microprocessors and all those things and, and travel to space. Today, the conditions for a strong directionality are clear. We are at the confluence of three critical moments. The turning point of the ICT revolution, which I just explained, which is a time for social sustainability. The climate threat with the urgency of environmental sustainability and the post pandemic reconstruction, which provided or which created consensus on public action. It was so clear that the government had to do something. It was so clear that we were all in this together. And if the climate were to bring anything similar, even mildly similar to the pandemic, but permanent, we'd be in real trouble. So we have understood that the state has to come back, forget about all this austerity, all this worrying mainly about the debt and not mainly about investment and wealth creation. 
So that's where we are. And the stage is then set for synergistic, smart, green, fair, and global growth. It is up to governments to proactively establish the conditions, but it's up to us to pressure governments into that. If business understands the critical moment without myopic short-term interests, we can set up a positive sum game between business and society, between advanced emerging and developing countries, and between humanity and the planet. And guess what that would be? The golden age of the global knowledge society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carlotta. Thank you, Carlotta. I cannot hear. Is somebody talking? Um, can you hear me? Sorry. Sorry, it's me. I was speaking and uh, I thought uh, I didn't realize I'm, I'm mute. So thanks for the talk a lot. Um, that's what I was saying while, while I was on mute. And uh, there are actually questions now, uh, but we'll uh, reserve that for later once we are done with all the uh, presentations. So at this point, I'm going to uh, give the floor to Andrea for her talk. Okay. Um, so, um, it is a great honor to be in part of this session and um, I am um, um, almost at a loss of what I can tell you uh, after, after uh, Carlota's very inspiring um, uh, and full of hope um, presentation. Um, so, I will, um, I will try to give you a view of um, what I think happens in, in the finance world in the context of the green economy and how to make sense for yourself uh, from the huge amount of information which floats uh, around us on this topic. Um, so, my perspective comes from the fact that I'm a solution architect, so I usually look um, how things work um, in banking, how banks are put together, but I'm also a researcher and um, I, um, as a researcher, I think differently about this, um, these topics uh, and I go a lot into modeling what I what I see in the world, including banking, including finance. So that's my perspective. If you if you if you want to understand what angle I'm coming from. Uh, just a second. I think this covers the do, do, do. Um, okay. Um, so what is very important to have in mind at the moment is that the Paris Agreement, which is which is now in place, it's a sort of choose your own adventure type of approach to dealing with climate. So it's different from the Kyoto Protocol, uh, which established um, targets um, for countries uh, and more specifically for develop, uh, developed countries, only for developed countries, not for, uh, not for others. For example, China was not included. In the Paris Agreement, um, it each country and each entity could choose what it wants to do and when. There are no targets and there are no timetables. Hence, very often the confusion of what, what is going on. So you will see um, uh, projects and proposals from made by cities like Toronto and Paris, by corporation banks and, and so on. Um, when I think about um, when I think about uh, finance or well, financial world, I, I do think about it as a as a complex system. And many people will say, no, no, it's not a it's not complex. It's complicated, but it is actually complex. And um, the fact that uh, Giorgio Parisi got um, um, a Nobel Prize uh, uh, this past month, um, it's it's just a recognition of the methods uh, which he developed and which at the moment are applied by 
by uh, researchers um, in on the financial services system. It's difficult when you look at something like that, it's actually much more complicated than that. This is just an artistic uh, artifact. <laughs> um, when, when you look at that, um, how how do you how where do you start if you want to understand what's going on um and i would propose at least um three layers um for for simplicity but it usually it it's enough so the blue layer which is uh, where the banking and uh, the individual and commercial banking happens and where most of the fintech world stays it's the visible level of banking it's how people interact with with banking and there is a, a multitude of um um applications approaches uh, startups uh, and so on the second layer is how the banks are put together and how they interact with each other and the third layer the red one is a financial market infrastructure the gray uh, correspondence of each uh, layer are actually the parts which are not incorporated in the regulated industry. And sometimes they are legal, sometimes they are illegal, as we will see. So if I look at all these, all these layers and all these systems, at the moment, what we have, um, uh, it, it's a multitude of frameworks around banking only, which are all about net zero and uh, climate change and responsible banking. So we have uh, six principles of responsible banking. We have the Gla uh, Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, Net Zero Banking Alliance, all these are different frameworks to which banks sign uh, sign up and then they commit to various um, objectives. Uh, we have the EU Green Deal, we have the um, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which are an overarching framework for, for all this. So it seems that a lot of what is going on, it's around uh, frameworks for analyzing and reporting what banks do. And what um, and from this point of view, we look at least from this uh, from two points of view. So uh, all these frameworks hit in one or the other. Either they look um, at the bank's own footprint, and you have um, lots of frameworks there. But um, banking as such is not an industry with a big um, um, emissions um, uh, footprint. It, 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 not manufacturing anything by comparing in comparison with others, they are okay. And most of these frameworks are around the client uh, exposure. Um, I invite you to, to look at each of these frameworks. <laughs> um, I, I didn't want to spend the, 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 the few minutes that we have together uh, detailing this framework, but I can tell you that what you will find behind, probably you will not be surprised, um, very often is a large Excel file, which you can download and play around with. And um, that is the best uh, the banking industry could come with. <laughs> um, in order to analyze the client exposure and the portfolios. And there are lots of problems with, with that. And we we could we could just think of you know classifying um, industries as good, bad, not so good, not so, not so bad. And then um, uh, having a, 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 a kind of um, summarized information about, about your exposure. It, it's, it's not enough what, what is going on. So I, I do know that most banks now do their own exercises trying to, to clarify really what exposures they have and their, their reasons for doing that. Um, another layer from uh, the ones that uh, I introduced them it's uh, formed in, in terms of uh, approaches to, to dealing with climate change is, is formed from all sorts of partnership between uh, startup or small technology companies and uh, financial institutions. And if I were to group them in categories, what are we looking at? Because really there is a, a jungle out there. I would say that you have a big category around risk analysis and um, you, you, you have at least... Uh, um, 
uh, let's say two types of uh, risk. You look at the transition risk and the physical risk. Um, and in each of these categories, you have uh, taxonomies which um, uh, banks need to report on. So uh, there are multitude of companies in, in helping banks doing that. Um, in insurtech, so-called insurtech, uh, evaluating um, new types of uh, new types of risk and calculating insurance for uh, events which before was entirely uncommon or not insurable, but now they are quite common. So something needs to be done. Uh, regulatory technology. So again, reporting uh, around those framework and and investing. So in investing, you would say this is a actionable thing because it's one part to figure out okay what um what do you have what your client exposure but then you need to start acting do i invest in this industry uh, um, should i stop now if i stop now what happens with that industry do we have a transition plan do we have something to put in place or if i invest now and i know that this is something which will be dying um the chances are that you remain with, with with stranded assets. So even if it seems like a simple game, oh, don't invest in this invest, don't invest in this anymore. If there is nothing in place for that particular need, niche, whatever, uh, it it uh, it mm, yeah, it, the transition it's uh, it's quite uh, difficult. Um, another, um, let's say, uh, level, the, the lower one, the one which I told you about earlier, uh, the, the fintech one or the visible one, the one where we can um, engage with uh, as, as individual, aim at influencing people um, how they decide, spend and, and invest. And they are... Um, a number of um, indexes which are calculating or calculating or are suggesting um, uh, the equivalent um, emissions for let's say a pair of shoes uh, made of leather or um, a cup of coffee or um, and based on these indexes like the Alland index or the economy um, there are companies which um, uh, some, sometimes embedded in your banking applications, sometimes not, uh, which calculate uh, your carbon emissions if, if you are interested to do that. So Kogo here or Meniga here or Countable and so on, or they calculate the footprint of the um, uh, brands that you are consuming. So really um when you look at so many frameworks then probably frameworks around banking for uh, figuring out what is happening in in finance you would think that we sorted out the situation and actually we didn't um so i will give you a brief example uh, that uh, we will be using also in the mapping um, in the mapping exercise with adrian and uh, carlota and the uh, example is um, um, very much uh, documented and, and researched. Uh, the, the, you have uh, um, the link to the, to the paper there, Greening the Euro System Collateral Framework. So briefly, it's the following situation. So we are saying that we are classifying in the banking world the um, financial instruments and all the um, investments that, that we have. And we know where we are. Um, when we do this, uh, what <laughs> the, the, the most critical information or the most critical step is who decide what is green and is, what is not and what degree of green is that from this point of view, the you know today appointment of a UK representative for climate change and financial innovation is worrying, um, as an aside. But um, in this in this case, uh, the example is about the euro system, which is uh, the set of central banks which use euro plus the European Central Bank. Uh, the euro system creates money for commercial banks. And um, 
it, it lends money to the central uh, to uh, to commercial banks. It lends money to commercial banks in exchange for a guarantee for a collateral. So we have a collateral framework in the euro system, which establishes what type of collateral you can accept uh, from from the banks in exchange for central bank money. And what you include as a collateral, what is considered acceptable, and the terms. Um, uh, paid for different types of collateral really influence what happens in the wider economy because it signals to the market its view uh, about, uh, the, the view of the uh, euro system about industry and their riskiness. So you would say that after we discuss, um, uh, I don't know, in 10 possible frameworks, uh, principle of responsible banking, banking for net zero and so on about what is good, what is bad, we sorted out this problem. In reality, no, we didn't. So this is very recent. So we have on the left a commercial bank and here a central bank. I put here ECB, but it could be any central bank. And um, this commercial bank needs some central bank money and it gives as a collateral some bonds, doesn't matter what bonds at the moment. And the bonds are value, let's say 100 million euros. And in exchange, the bank receives those money minus the haircut, a percentage that the uh, bank uh, it, um, considers that it's a degree of, of risk for that situation. So how green is that collateral? You would think that the central banks also implemented uh, uh, those policies and they, uh, they, they influenced such choices. And in reality, 59% of the corporate bonds that the ECB accepts as collateral, they are carbon intensive companies. Then what, what else can we think about? How big is the average haircut? So how much? they receive, the banks they receive, receive in exchange for those collaterals. And um, I don't know if you see this. Um, and you will see that actually the bank penalizes non-carbon intensive sectors because the haircut is almost 14%. While for the 10, first 10 biggest fossil fuel companies, just 1% or 4%. So it means that if you, if you put a, a fossil fuel uh, bond, uh, you will get 99 for the value of 100 for that bond. While if you put a non-carbon intensive one, you will get 100 minus 14. So this is a mechanism. So when Carlota says that we design the system and the technology is, it just doesn't happen, we design the systems to behave in a certain way. This is a typical behavior, which is not modified for what we are saying. Um, So what could happen? What's the way, what's the way out of, of this situation? So it, it's very simple, uh, I would say. <laughs> um, so you could, once you, you change uh, the, the list of collateral um, the, the, um, accepted, what, you can exclude to a certain degree um, uh, fossil fuel companies or other carbon intensive companies or um, uh, change or align the haircuts uh, with, the, with the climate change uh, policies, which is not the case um, at the moment. So while all this happens, all those frameworks happen and all these discussions happen, and for some areas, we know the mechanisms that we need to change and probably they will change. The problem is that largest part of the finance world is, is really well hidden. And here I refer not only to Panama and Pandora, but many other things that we, we have no idea about. And uh, it, 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 it's actually impossible to control how, how those are uh, truly invested. So that's all from me. Okay. Thank you very much, Andra. Um, and I believe at this point it will be uh, Adrian's uh, turn. And Adrian, the plan is for you to do some mapping, right, based on uh, the first two talks. Yeah. 
Okay, you can hear me all right. Um, yeah, so last last year at Map Camp, I built a, a map in sort of real time. I pre-built it and I kind of extended it and revealed it as I was going. And uh, it sort of worked out, even though I created it the night before and it was a bit stressful. So um, we're kind of in a similar situation here, except that um, I've been studying what Carlotta has been saying. I have her book. Everyone should go read the book, right? Principles for the Technical Revolutions of Financial Capital, and trying to understand all the ideas in it, and then um, looking at her presentations recently and trying to extract how, how can we map that. And I think there's there's three different flavors of maps. Uh, one of them is more the technologies that she's talking about, and they're relatively simplistic, kind of the typical kind of maps that we see where we're looking at technology evolution from genesis through to commodity. The second type of map is more about social mapping, and the axis is different. It's more more the, and I'm using, I'm going to use the axis that Simon was using when he was talking about culture um to to try and capture that so we'll talk about the social change as a separate thing um and then i tried to as we as i was listening to carl Otter, i was trying to capture the things that i hadn't talked about and if you look at the the vertical axis on a map the value chain the question is what is on that value chain and at the top of some of the value chains you have consumers um at the top of you know you're basically looking at um the consumer value chain then there's another one when you're looking at more social things i've got effectively got um corporate interests at the top what are corporations doing and then the final one that i created because i realized it was sort of missing as i was listening to carlotta was more about the sort of what are governments what's public policy things in that space so I'm going to share my screen and hopefully you can, you'll be able to see what I'm doing here. All right. Okay. So you can see my browser here. Um, so what I decided to do was try to map the start of the age of automobiles, oil, plastics, and mass production. Okay. So what we've got here is the previous age has gone all the way through and completed. So what I figured we'd do was start, what is, what is a map? Can we try and map the beginning of that age? And then I'll look at what it looks like at the end of that age and use that as the beginning of the age we're currently in the technology age and then look at where we are now in that age, and then try to look at where we might be in that age. So that's, and I've sort of pre-prepared some maps. So I'm looking for input from uh, Carlotta and Andra in particular to see if this makes sense. So the first thing I did was put automobiles, plastics, mass production, and oil on a map. And at the start of the age, um, Oil, I think, is a product at this point, um, but we need an anchor. So, so the way the, the way I decided this, automobiles at the beginning of the age were largely custom built. They were coach builders, right? At the beginning of the age of of, of uh, mass production, it was the transition was becoming to the Ford Model T. So we were transitioning into from custom built to product. Plastics, we had Bakelite, and we had didn't have all the variety of plastics we had today. Mass production was something that was developed in the previous, um, the idea of factories came from the previous industrial revolutions. So we knew how to build factories, but we were now building mass production. And oil was mostly extracted and used locally at the beginning of this. So, but what we need is a consumer. And I decided to add a couple of things on there. So we need a consumer that is consuming all of these things. And they're basically consuming products. And I want it to be a little bit more general than just automobiles. So I've got consumer packaged goods, all of the things of the consumer age that came along. 
and I connected them up like this. So oil is needed to make plastics, to run automobiles. It, it powers mass production and consumer packaged goods. There's a lot of plastics in there and in packaging them. And those are the products the consumer has. So does, does that make some kind of sense as a starting point? Yeah, I'm getting, I'm watching, I, I can see Carlotta nodding or shaking her head. So we'll go, we'll go on that at this point. So the other thing that happened now, consumers need to know about these products and they need to figure out how to pay for them. So what we had was the beginning, this is again at the start of the age, we had the start of marketing as a thing and the channels that, that it would use, you know, newspapers and that kind of marketing billboards. And we had consumer finance starting up as, as, as a new, new area. Um, and I think for oil production was local and major countries had local corporations. So I think British petroleum, right? That was just doing gasoline and in, in that was the oil company for England, right? It, there was all of the oil companies that you see have a country name in their, in their title because they started locally in those countries. Um, so then what we had was um, a little bit of maturation of the markets. And so I've got some evolution here. Uh, let's do these one by one. So consumer finance, I think um, we eventually ended up with credit cards. We had all kinds of you know, high purchase and things in between, but it's really become a commodity today. You can get a credit card from anyone there's lots of ways of doing consumer finance. So it went from a conceptual idea to something that matured so that you can finance whatever you want to buy. Um, and then automobiles evolved to be products. Um, oil um, became global. A lot of the companies bought each other. There was sort of consolidation. We ended up with OPEC and the global oil companies. So BP doesn't just operate um, in, in the UK, it has operations globally, right? That kind of thing. So now what we've got is a fairly messy looking map because of all of the evolution and all the way the lines, the lines flow on it. Um, but I'm also gonna evolve uh, marketing, which started to become productized. Um, as we went through this um, this process. So instead of a very exploratory market, it becomes more productized and consumer packaged goods become very much commodities. So that's that's the idea here. Um, I, and I, does that does that make sense? Are things in the right kind of places? Should I move things around? Does does that make some kind of sense? Yeah, some kind of nodding from Carlotta. Did did I I obviously missed a whole lot of things out, but the point of a map is you you concentrate on the way to build, think about building a map, is think about the things that are going to move or that you want to make strategic decisions about and then leave them on the map. And then you have just enough supporting things to actually connect them together, right? If you think about, you know, the typical map you have on your phone, you can have the satellite map, which tells you whether there's, you know, is it green or brown in the ground, right? and what the color the buildings are, or you can just say, I don't want to know that detail. I just want to know where the roads are. And then it's easier to see the locations of the things you're trying to find, right? So there's these different levels of detail. You want to extract the detail, remove the detail to make it easier to manage the map. Okay, so that was one map. And then I've actually figured out, by the way, I, this took me forever to figure out with online Wadley maps, but. If you, I'm on a Mac, and if I scroll upwards, the whole thing, the usage and the instructions and the guides and the help stuff is hiding down here. And it took me forever to figure, I accidentally did this one time and suddenly realized that's where all the help stuff was. So it drove me crazy that I couldn't figure out how to help stuff. So I'm just doing that sort of two finger swipe up on the mouse pad here. And then the other thing you can do with maps, which is quite clever, is you can have links that take you to the next map. So I can click on here and get me to the next map, but I will actually um, go directly to that map. So this is, this is the previous map. 
except I took, a, instead of having all the red stuff, it's basically just going to the end point. So what I did was I took all the evolution and I just left myself with the places I had evolved to. So now I'm looking at towards the end of that evolution or phase. Um, and then I realized that I'd forgotten to evolve plastics. So I'm going to do that. So uh, actually, I don't need to evolve plastics. There we go. All right, so plastics over there. So this is sort of the, if this is the 1960s, for example, all right, so it's the end of that industrial thing just before the technology revolution started. This is what we had as a baseline to build on top of. And the way that you think about the this in Wadley mapping is that you once something has evolved, you build a new thing on top of it. So this very much ties into the way Carlotta describes these revolutions. So it's basically just that the previous map moved over. So then if we look at the age of information, um, what I've done is sort of pushed some of the other things down lower and removed the ones that didn't seem particularly interesting. So I've got consumer marketing product. I pushed automobiles and oil down a little bit. And now we need to add information technology and communications to this map. Um, so here we've got, these are the things I thought were interesting. So this is thinking of 1971. Okay, what did we have in the 1970s, right? We had telephones, which were pretty much a commodity at that point. The telecommunication industry just got a phone. You could, you know, phone, phones were fairly simplistic. Um, we had business computing and the microprocessor enabled the home computer of the 1970s, 1980s. This is the pre-internet phase. Um, and automobiles didn't have computers in them. They were just sitting there as a product that was oil driven, right? So I'm trying to sort of introduce these things here. And then some other things I think I needed to introduce were, you know, need electricity to run that, and it's largely running off fossil generation. So this is the sort of the 1980s kind of view of the world. Does that make some kind of sense? You can sort of see where I'm going here. I'm trying to figure out, okay, what was left over from the previous revolution? How does that tie into the new one? Um, now, if we look at um, where we are today in the in this age of information technology, um, I just brought, really revealed the whole thing. And so what we've got is the consumer um, is has social applications, and they have they're using their they have a smartphone. I, I sort of ignored the home computer. Like most of our lives today are on smartphones. So I'm simplifying it. So the smartphone is a thing that you use for social applications for communication. If you think about what you do mostly on it, it's a video phone, meaning you can watch things on Netflix or YouTube, but also it's for Zoom and the things we use to communicate. And we use it for getting Uber and Lyft and whatever, we use it for ride share. So there's a few kinds of things where we're either interacting with services, we're consuming content or we're communicating. And Rideshare is becoming a little more of a commodity over here. It's a utility. Um, it's the utility replacement for the automobile. So I mean, we still have cars, but ultimately this is where we're going. So the smartphone ends up as sort of this key thing. And the microprocessor in the smartphone is interesting because it's not a product. It's not like the off the shelf Intel chip that we see in other markets. What we're seeing is fully custom processors. Like Apple designs its own processors from scratch. And we're seeing for cloud computing, AWS designing its own processes, which are differentiated. So we're seeing some product differentiation at the microprocessor design level. So that's an, an, sort of just an interesting thing. I'm not sure how relevant it is to the, the overall thesis, but we went through a phase where everyone was designing their own computers. And then we went through a phase where everyone pretty much ended up using the Intel processors. And now we're going back to a, pro, a phase where people have the the ability to design it themselves um, is coming back in. Um, and then there's this idea that marketing is actually the product. So Facebook is a free service, even though it's very expensive to run because they are marketing you, like you are the product. 
And this is also how you know, Google and other companies in advertising work. So they're using the, the smartphone and the social applications and the video phone. That is the product that they are monetizing. It's the people. And then down here, I've got fossil fuel, but I've also got renewable energy. And I've got renewable energy as a product because to really get lots of renewable energy and to control the percentage you have, you have to do power purchase agreements. We're seeing this across many uh, large industrial companies like Amazon. We're buying, we have 10 gigawatts of renewable energy under contract, right? We can't just assume that the local energy providers will give us green energy. We can't just say, please give us the green energy. Um, we have to go and fund wind farms and solar farms and do specific agreements to do it. It hasn't commoditized yet. And finally, the telecommunications world. Um, telecommunications with the internet has really become dumb pipes. Um, the telcos really hate becoming dumb pipes, but uh, fundamentally, as long as my phone can connect to my social app, I don't care how it got there. There's the only added value you can have is it got there quicker and, and maybe I paid less, but it's extremely commoditized and it's not the telecommunications industry is becoming less interesting because of that it's not adding value. It just, they keep trying to find ways to add value. So that's kind of where I think we are today. Is there any comments, do you want to talk a bit about this or does that sort of make sense? I want, that, I want to, I've got quite a few things to get through here. Okay, I think I'll just move on unless if somebody has, if, if either Andrew or Carlotta think I see something they don't understand or they want to push back on, then you know, uh, jump in. So where are we going in the future? So I think if we evolve the video phone, um, I think the thing, the reason that video video applications aren't completely universal right now is just bandwidth. I think what we'll find with, as 5G rolls out globally, instead of just video being a core feature in the developed markets, the developing world is going to get more and more bandwidth. It's going to become more universal. Like trying to have a a FaceTime call with somebody in Africa is, you know, in a in a remote area is not likely to work. They're not going to have enough bandwidth to do video. That kind of thing is going to become more ubiquitous and we have more and more video based applications which expect bi directional video bandwidth to be the key feature. Zoom is kind of the killer app here in some respect that's sort of showing what can be done. Um, and social apps, one of the interesting things with social apps is we seem to, seem to get new ones all the time. Like TikTok came along a few years ago and now has 3 billion users. So what we actually have is a pipeline of new social apps because the new kids don't want to be on the same social app as their parents, I think. That's one of the features here, right? So they always go to find a new one. You know, Facebook used to be for college students when it came out. Now it's for the old people, right? So, so, and, and the young people are on Snapchat or they're on um, TikTok or whatever, or some new thing that just came out that we haven't heard of yet. So what we have is social apps as a pipeline, which is delivering new users to a marketing experience. You start off with this early unmonetized application and then you figure out how to monetize those users. So it's sort of the, and if you want to be marketing to the new consumers, you have to jump on the new social app. So I, I treated this sort of as a pipeline. There's always going to be new social apps coming along, which will get to very high user counts very quickly. And this is kind of the scary part for Facebook, why they keep trying to acquire them like WhatsApp and Instagram. Um, and they would like to have acquired Snap and um, probably TikTok and whatever. So this you'll see, I think over and over again, you'll see new emerging things here. Um, and then we're evolving um, renewable energy um, with a lot of resistance uh, as Andrew was talking about uh, for institutional resistance to get the electricity to be renewable. Okay, and I've got, I've got some annotations here. So TikTok, it's social apps pipeline from novel to marketing commodity, Zoom, video ubiquity. Oh, the other thing is autonomous rideshare. So it, the, we aren't just talking about using Uber to call up a car. We'll get with the, the future we're heading towards is, a, is that Uber 
has this extra low cost option where there isn't a driver in the car. They didn't have to pay the driver. And if the route you're going on um, is one that the self-driving cars can manage, then there's the option will appear to take us a, a driverless car from A to B, right? So you can see how, although driverless autonomous vehicles can't do everything, they will start to be able to do a few routes reliably and you can, you'll start seeing the ride sharing companies starting to head in this direction. This is just sort of the obvious direction we're going in. And the sort of Tesla are talking about doing it, Uber, you know, are the incumbent and some combination of the two will turn into something interesting here. So we've now got mobility as a service using the technology to deliver it and at, at potentially a much lower cost because you're not just paying for the car. You're, you don't have, you're only paying for the car. You don't have to pay for the person sitting in the car as well. So that's uh, an interesting sort of concept. Um, this is pretty speculative. Any any other thoughts thoughts on this? Does this make some sense? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> okay. Right, so the next thing I wanted to talk about was more about society rather than the products and the technologies. And I'm going to go back to the a modified version of the the map I drew last year is to try and come up with some basis for this. So last year I, I had this idea that I wanted to talk about um, ideas versus this morality chain from societal to corporate morality. What do corporations think? What does society think? And I had this I changed the axis along the bottom. I wanted to talk about ideas, building consensus, and there's a way of doing this with Wardley mapping. So if we look at Wardley mapping, here's, here's like the cheat sheet for Wardley mapping. The x-axis labels that we normally use are genesis, custom, product, and commodity. And what I was kind of wanting to use was concept hypothesis theory universally accepted, but that wasn't exactly right. And then Simon pointed out, you can just need to pick one of these, and one of these, and one of these, and one of these. You don't have to use the same row. So um, what I came up with here, let me just uncomment this one, is what I'm actually talking about is concepts, new crazy ideas. They emerge and build consensus. And then they start to converge, meaning there are competing options to buy into and then they become broadly accepted. Um, oops. So let's try not to mess this up. Let's uncomment a whole bunch more stuff. So if you think about a corporation, it, it is messaging its, its morals. What are the morals of a corporation? What does it stand for? What's the purpose, right? And if you think about that, it's, it's it's talking to its customers, its shareholders, and its employees about what it stands for. And what you have is the executive statements. What does, you know, Jeff Bezos comes out and says something about the climate pledge or whatever. Um, there's marketing content, which is all the PR marketing, what the company puts out on its website, says this is all the stuff you're doing. And then there's the private position internally, which may be things that are being developed that aren't being talked about yet. You know, we're going to make the announcement about say a climate pledge kind of thing but it's a private position for now and it will eventually the executive will announce it and then the marketing content will come out to support it those kinds of things uh, you see happening um, and then you have all this internal content that supports it and some of the issues happen when employees see that the private position doesn't line up with the public position and things like that. So this, this is kind of the, the difficult thing. How do you get the organization to change its internal positioning to line up with what it wants its public position to be? So if you look at this internal content, the things that are driving it are product differentiation. I want a green product. Um, rehabilitation for, I, we did something bad and we want to atone for it. Uh, direct losses where um, people are refusing to buy your product because of something. Um, and then supply chain mandates. The people that buy our product, the, the, we, we, our company is in a chain of suppliers and consumers. Somewhere up the supply chain, somebody is mandating that we, uh, we, are, we have a certain moral position on child labor or you know, green 
or supply chains or something. And finally, you get the board level mandate where the board says, you know, in order to constrain the risk, we need to have these, diff these different things being mandated. And then if you look um, along sort of the bottom nearer the societal things, there are fringe ideas, there are movements. This is where you're building consensus. A fringe is a very sort of, yeah, we, it's very much emerging. A movement is where there's a consensus and there's an identifiable movement around something. And then you get these convergent things like unions and societal norms. There are multiple unions. Some people like unions, some people don't. There are different societal norms you can subscribe to, but the, it's a pluralistic view. There are lots of different ways that, that they're all they're converging, but they, aren't, they haven't fully converged. And finally, you get some broadly accepted things, which are there are regulations and laws. So, yeah, there's one way of doing this, and we're going to enforce that one way. So I have a few things that I kind of did went through last time. One of these is the idea of the minimum wage, right? It's obviously something employees care about. There have been executive statements about it. The supply chain may say we're not going to buy from companies that don't, don't pay a minimum wage. Um, we've seen, I think, from the if we think about from the age of oil to the age of IT, how has the idea of a minimum wage changed? So I'm not sure if this is exact. I'm trying to capture some of what Carlotta was talking about here, right? So from the age of oil, minimum wage was something that was very much a sort of a, an idea that, was, that hadn't really formed much in the 1970s, right? like 1960s, 70s. But now it's something, there's regulations, there's laws about it, but it's still, you know, there's a lot of pushback on it, but there are laws that there is an existing minimum wage in many countries. And then there's just arguments about how, what it should be set at, right? Um, a bit more, in the similar thing is universal basic income. This is sort of somewhere between being a fringe and a movement. The idea of universal basic income probably didn't really exist in the previous industrial age. Maybe it was very much a fringe idea. Um, but I think that what happens is it starts to become a little bit more of a societal norm. There are some countries in the world where this is happening. I think Norway kind of has it as a societal norm. Um, there's other countries and other parts of the world experimenting with it. So I think what we'll see is, is this starting to evolve? And I'm going to get rid of the minimum wage one because it's um, getting in the way here. So maybe universal basic income, and there's this inertia thing here. There's a big barrier. You've got to build a lot of consensus. The societal norms have to start pulling it into being a convergent option. And eventually there'll be regulations around it and maybe maybe it's gonna take laws for it to really happen, right? To be, to be a real thing. So it's one of these things that's being pulled forward um, for, by, as by the societal transitions. Make some kind of sense? All right. Um, so let's see if I can get rid of that. It disappears, good. So the next one I'm going to talk about very quickly is racial equality, which is something that, you know, in the 1960s, we started to get laws about racial equality in the US and around the world. So it was, it was but it wasn't universally there. And I think what we've seen, you know, right now, racial equality is, is a you know, pretty strong topic. It's got, there's a lot of laws. There's still people that don't, you know, pushing back on it, but it's pretty much regulated and it's the law of the land in most parts of the world. Um, but if we look at Black Lives Matter as a as something that was a big topic um, like a year ago, certainly, it started out basically as a, as a sort of a fringe movement. And it was amazing all the statements we got from executives on Black Lives Matter, right? If you, you got all these emails last year from saying we care about the pandemic and we care about Black Lives Matter from all these companies that you vague, had some vague re relationship with. You got an email from the executive saying we care about these things. And I think what that did was it pushed Black Lives Matter from being a fringe idea to being um, a, a fairly strong program. And, and really the societal norms are starting to pull it that, that we need to reform the police force, we need to reform the way that some of the more ingrained institutional things, which are like, yeah, we have laws saying it should be equal, but the institutional 
systems are not set up to support that. So that's kind of what's what I think is happening there. Um, and then finally, going to talk about sustainability. Um, 1960s, 70s, we had kind of Earth Day, we had the beginnings of the green movement, it was extremely nascent, but we, we had very little um, worry about sustainability in the 1960s and 70s. Um, we started to get regulations in the 70s. Um, we've started to get things like supply chain mandates because I want to have a green product, right? I want to have an organic product, I want to have a green product. I want my product in some way is being labeled as being marketed as being more sustainable. So people started worrying about the supply chain. And then boards started thinking about risk assessments. Like we have, we have what's the risk to the company, the impact from climate change to the company, that kind of risk assessment. How does that work? And so that starts to drive sustainability. And we've, we're starting to get things like science-based targets and the climate pledge as companies start trying to do something about sustainability, what's their water reuse policy, uh, recycling, all those kinds of things. And society, sustainability is now being driven a lot by societal norms as we get to the social license to operate becomes a more of a factor now, like, do I want to deal with this company based on whether they have a good social social uh, option? And so I think sustainability has evolved over to somewhere in this range now. It's broadly accepted, getting towards being broadly accepted, but it's still competing. There's still a substantial resistance um, and a substantial chunk of the population around the world who are in economically incented to not support sustainability. They're making their money out of fossil fuels. They're making their money out of the uh, previous age. And this is the disruption that has to happen. And this is why it is potentially kind of a, a very disruptive transition here as we figure out how to, how to do this. And eventually we're getting more laws that drive sustainability into the point where it's the laws of the land and you just have to do it. And we're getting more of those kinds of things. So that's sort of a rerun of what I did last year. Um, and then I just have some live topics and I, I was I was trying to capture some things that I hadn't covered that uh, as Carlotta was talking. So what we've got is, I think she was, there was a section really, she was talking about the government and the things we get from the government and across social sustainability, the climate threat, and post pandemic reconstruction. And so the way I was thinking about this was governments have done security for a long time. Like the government's existed to raise armies, basically that's thousands of years old. Education is something, you know, hundreds of years, governments have decided it's good to educate their population. And most parts of the world invest in health and the government's involved in health, either with national health services or you know, the US will maybe one day catch up and actually have a national health service. And I'll be able to put this in, accept it, but that's just, yeah, anyway. And then we have, I, I added progressive taxation in here because I think that's something the government is responsible for. Um, it's convergent. It's one of these things, some countries have progressive trans taxation, others don't. It's one of the things we're trying to push to the right. Um, and then you've got green energy that governments are pushing and it's sort of emerging. Um, and then Carlotta talked about meaning and creativity and um, maybe Carlotta, you can come on, on, on the microphone a bit and talk a little bit about what you meant about the meaning and creativity piece as I was trying to understand um, what those might look like or how to map them. Just one comment, finance yeah. is missing. It's missing completely. Uh, so, uh, um, um, the the green economy can be achieved but there are two frameworks of mind one is big finance big banks private money will drive it somehow uh, they will suddenly become um, uh, you know um, socially aware and invested in the community or it's driven by the by the state um, or it's a combination of the two um, do you think that's and, probably an emerging thing right now? 
It, there's it's some, a, the it, ESG funds are kind of driving this, right? And there's a bunch of things in the Net Zero Banking Alliance, but it's not really gone mainstream yet, has it? It's a huge debate uh, there because the question is who decides what is green or not? So under this ESG uh, frame uh, um, umbrella, just because somebody says that a fund is, is, is green doesn't mean it's green. There's a lot of greenwashing happening and there's a lot of power associated with uh, allocating um, these labels, what is green and what is not. You know, we think about it like a prism, you know, the light comes through and something else comes on the other side. <laughs> Who defined that prism <laughs> uh, basically influences how those numbers and how those flows of capital uh, look like. And this is where we as citizens should pay attention a lot. And this is where a responsible state should pay attention and be uh, involved. I mean, we are at the level where such definitions and such prisons are in Excel, are in an Excel file. This is, this is where we are. And somebody decides what values we have there, you know. Honestly, it, it, it's a critically important um, uh, issue. And yeah, that's it. Yeah. It should I'm, be on I the map. Some map. <laughs> I, I, well, I have a I have a map of Andra coming up next, and so we make sure we don't run out of time. But I wanted to, to see if Carlotta had some comments on this. If you could unmute yourself and see if this is making sense to you. Oh, Carlotta, you're on mute still. You wanted to know what I meant by meaning and creativity. It's associated to two things. One is education which is going to be an asset much more important than owning a home, which was the asset of the, of the mass production era. So you could fill it up with electrical appliances. So you could spend your time as a couch potato watching TV and, uh, and cooking in the, in, the, in the garden and so on, this sort of and driving all the time. Uh, the education is about something that relates to you. So we would have health, we would have uh, activity, creativity instead of possession. Possession becomes a much less important possession of things, a much less important than possession of, of meaning, of purpose, of so people would do anything from, uh, you know, thinking that joy is exercising, going up mountains, doing bungee jumps or whatever, you know, this sort of very, your body, your health, your ideas, and also people on the web uh, creating all sorts of things and, and even and charging for it, you know, individuals becoming uh, producers of not just writing books or whatever, which, which a small elite of the population did, but lots of people are doing even in a small way uh photogra photography videos things and sending them around and this is this is a new way of having fun which is different from sitting down to watch tv which which was the main thing so it, it is they are two very important elements of what i have called the new lifestyles because each of the technological revolutions has brought a new lifestyle which in turn creates a whole range of products and services that serve that particular lifestyle. So the lifestyle, of course, of the mass production is what I just described. The new lifestyle, I think, is going to be based on rental rather than purchase, uh, services rather, rather than products, self, uh, you know, health, exercise, yoga, all those things which you, can, you have seen growing among the elite. And normally what happens in every technological revolution is that you have an elite that begins doing the new things and then they get copied both by business that makes it cheaper to do and by people who aspire to that. And that's how we get a different thing. So green is also part of that sustainability, I mean, of that future lifestyle which has to do with what we will require. So basically those are the things that give meaning 
and and creativity to to the new the new conditions for for a good life the aspiration so for a good life yeah. Um, so if Adrian, we think about this, so one Adrian, one thing, sorry, Jen, Adrian, do you want um, to? I just wanted to check. Um, so I don't think we're going to have time for, you know, a QA and a because you're going, still going to go through another map, right? Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Uh, I think even, we're going to. Yeah. Um, even if we, like, say, uh, just devote the rest of the time, you know, to questions, uh, to q and I don't think we're going to be able to go through all the questions anyway. So I'm just right. thinking uh, for, uh, and we, we apologize because obviously, you know, the, what they're talking about here is very interesting and I don't, I do want to interrupt. Um, if people are going through the networking area later on, uh, I'm hoping Andra and Carlotta and Adrian uh, will be there even for a few yep. minutes. So maybe we can like yeah. uh, pick up the questions there um, and we'll let Adrian finish uh, his uh, presentation. Okay. Um, so my thought here was education has been very institutionalized for thousands of years. Um, and those institutions used to control education, but now education's become democratized. It's personalized, it's over the internet. So maybe what we really want to do is sort of it's personal education and it comes sort of over here somewhere and it's supporting the creativity and meaning but what we really want then is more government support for individual education rather than government support for the educational institutions institutionalized education does that make some kind of sense Carlotta? makes sense yes yeah okay so I need to patch and, this and, up. But so of course, the, the public education also has to change. You have to flip the classroom. We have to have not just people recording lectures, but making fantastic cinema-like things, you know, teaching online and then, and then spending the education time in schools, uh, discussing, creating, having experiments, doing research, um, you know, a, a completely different sort of thing so that uh, people will be taught to work in teams, to be creative, to be, you know, not not just to answer two plus two equals four, no matter how complex it's all answer what the teacher said, you know, the questions and the yeah. exams, it's a different thing. So it actually means that the public, it isn't just because it's become private, a private endeavor with internet, it's also it's also a change in the nature of education, interdisciplinarity, basic things, lifelong learning, a, a whole revolution mm -hmm. in education, which hasn't really, really taken off. Yeah, but I think it's part of this, part of this golden age will be when that is in place. I think that that's kind of part of this because it's really enabled by the internet and the fact that all the information is out there. We have to figure out how to organize it and find new ways of consuming it. Yeah, so again, in the time, questions. yeah, in the remaining time, I want to talk, look at what I did trying to map what Andrew was talking about, and I'm not sure if I got this right, but these are sort of some of the elements she was talking about, financial markets, financial institutions, and I think individuals and commercial banking are the things that consume the financial markets. I think that was, I may, may have got this wrong. And then financial institutions, there's principles, TCFD footprint. These are fairly accepted. The Net Zero Banking Alliance is still more controversial. There's this effectively a collateral framework that we need to develop that is green rather than the current one, because the current collateral framework is supporting the oil industry. We need to switch the rules, which is going to drive climate policy or climate policy drives it or something. And then there were a few other things that I wasn't quite sure where they yeah. where they went. Does this yeah. make any sense to you, Andrew? Uh, yeah, it does. I I'm, I move pretty fast. I'm I'm, I'm aware. So um, what I was referring to as financial markets actually it was financial market infrastructure, which is a generic term for uh, all the systems and schemes which links financial institutions together, uh, because um, people think about banks or insurance companies or things like that, but they don't think what is in between them. And what is in between them is essential for how uh, the whole system functions. So that's financial market infrastructure. Individ individuals are always related to a, a, a bank or a, 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 an entity which plays the role of a bank. 
and a, a bank, it's a type of financial institution, a, a commercial bank. Um, Net Zero Banking Alliance, UN Principles for Responsible Banking, TCFD, are frameworks for basically reporting what happens in the banking world, either as my own footprint as a bank, or uh, what my client exposure. So here we're talking especially about investment banks or how banks invest their money and in which industries for which return. Whatever they hold in their portfolio, they want to do something with it. First, they want uh, to, to uh, some, uh, that industry to be profitable, to have good returns and so on. But also, they want to use their portfolio in exchange for accessing central bank money. So this is a collateral framework. What can I give you, you central bank? So you give me some money. So I interact with the other banks in the financial mar market infrastructure. And then if the central banks signal to you that I give you more money if you give me fossil fuel collateral, doesn't matter that the framework tells you, uh, oh, it would be nice if you would invest in something else, you know, but because the incentives are at odds with each other. Um, and that was just, just an example. But it, the parts that I think are interesting uh, and which I didn't insist a lot on, but there were lots of examples. There are lots of technology companies doing various things about this world of finance. On one side, it's an industry of reporting because reporting all those things, it's a massive industry. EU has its own taxonomy, UK decided that they want their own one. There are, I don't know how many classifications, there are armies and armies of people just reporting what's going on. But I'm more interested in the doing. Is it something changing in, in reality? And we can spot in, in, in we can spot companies doing things which make a difference. Um, and we will see how big the impact will be or if they manage to, to, uh, to succeed. Um, the examples I gave, gave at individual level are in my view, a way of educating people about the carbon footprint. It's not like all of a sudden it will have a big impact, but people start to, to realize that it's, it's, a real, it's a real thing. Um, and somehow it became, let's say, fashionable to have an app which tells you your carbon footprint. There is a lot to, to, be, to, to be done, honestly. And in my view, uh, the most important things at the moment are who decides the uh, indexes and the classification uh, in terms of carbon footprint. That, that all makes sense. So I think what I got from your talk was this idea of this green collateral framework, which is what's really going to drive sustainable investing, um, needs to be moved from an emerging place to being something that's converging. So more mm -hmm. and more countries around the world change the rules, the banks mm -hmm. start responding. So we've set up, we've gained the system against yeah, invisibly somewhere in this infrastructure, we've gamed the system. That's your that's your message. We need to change the public policy to change that gaming back again. And I haven't seen much discussion of your um, of this point that you've been making, sort of out in the wider industry. There was a, you know, I was seeing saw something today about the Net Zero Banking Alliance. There's as we get up to COP26, big discussions here. There was a really interesting. Um, publication by the IEA yesterday um, to go look at, which is kind of their brief for COP26, worth looking at that. Um, but I think also this banking alliance, fundamentally, the way we work is that stuff has to be funded to happen. And there's a lot of funds coming into renewables, but while we're still funding the fossil fuel industry, it's going to continue to be uh, blocking everything. And I think that the other thing that I've seen discussion of, which is also a little uncomfortable for people is that the economic models tend to be steady state. They predict gradual change, maybe. 
um, we're likely to have a much more radical change, like a, a, a recession-like change or, or a chaotic change. And there's a, the, oil in, the fossil fuel industry and the banking industry that's invested in it may collapse suddenly right, rather than having this gradual transition over the next 20, 30 years. So there's some, some things to watch for there um, where where the longer you hang on, the more overhang you have, and you're like Wiley e. Coyote has gone off the cliff, and eventually they look down and they actually fall, right? There's some some element like that, which seems to be, the more people get scared about the fact that there may be a like a 2008 style recession coming, the better, because then they may start acting sooner to actually be ready for it and be on the, the survivors of some uh, of the cataclysm rather than the the people sort of perpetuating the current current norms. So I think we're out of time right now. So I think um, sorry about the uh, we the discussion we had the we had the chat internally. Um, I'll be online and um, we can follow up on discussions on uh, on the map camp um, discussion boards and on Twitter and on wherever else. So thanks to everyone. Uh, yeah, yeah. So if, if you want another like maybe five minutes, uh, I think that should be all right. Okay, mm -hmm. we've got some Q and A here. There's lots of chat and Q and A. Um, actually, I will stop sharing my screen. I'll just go back to the discussion here. Um, how can we make pollution cost money so it acts as a force on markets? I think that's um, from, that's from earlier. Yeah. Yeah, you have to measure it <laughs> first. I mean, that's basically the cost of carbon. Carbon pricing is a interesting topic, much bigger than we have time to cover. Lots of reasons why there should be a price on carbon and a bunch of interestingly complex systems dynamics that if you do it wrong, it can maybe be counterproductive. So it has to be done carefully. But I think but ultimately there is, there is likely to be a price on carbon that is going to help pollution cost money. There's something else that we have to think about that uh, pollution, we always think of pollution as the gases that go in the air, but the pollution that has to do with uh, the whole the whole practice of planned obsolescence is an enormous amount of pollution that has to do with, with waste and the limits of the planet. So we need to move to a rental economy, to products that are that last 100 years, maintenance economy, which would create hundreds of thousands of jobs. So we would, we would have a prohibition of putting any appliance on the tip, absolutely not accepted to throw out in the municipal uh, garbage, whatever space, and then uh, that mean that companies would prefer both rental, so they would no longer sell, but they, they would be rental companies for whom they produce, and then uh, disassembly to rescue all the things that are, you know, all the materials to do, to do recycling and to do reusing and all that. So I think the whole range of, of pollution, we have to think about the whole thing. Of course, the plastic in the sea, we've got to find a way solve that so it costs money you make it cost money if you actually force people to swallow their own garbage or to then make products so long lasting that you don't that they're not garbage until a hundred years later when you can disassemble and of course you can do that with no more uh spare parts production, you just have it all on the web, you print it when you need it, 3D print it. All parts should be designed for 3D printing. Upgrading of products be done mainly with software or with 3D printed parts and not this business of having to buy a new product every three years or every, I mean, everybody buying a new product every three years and the more people that are consuming, that means that the poor will never get to have because we don't have enough materials. So that's that's another big change that has to happen. Move to rental and services, of course, products, change products to services so you don't waste. Okay, I think we're gonna have to wrap up, unfortunately, folks. Uh, we have a lot of interesting
interesting questions. I, I did uh, copy and paste them, uh, so I might send it to uh, the, the three speakers. And as I said, there's networking uh, between sessions. So if you go to the networking in, um, area, uh, Adria and Carlotta and Andrea will be there uh, to hopefully answer you know, some, some of your questions. Um, we're going to be back in this uh, window, uh, which is a round or a circle window at 6 p.m. Uh, UK time. Uh, and uh, the session following will be uh, Health of a Nation. So I, ho I hope to see you know, uh, most of you back here. And thanks everyone for joining us. And thanks to uh, Adrian, Carlotta, and Andra for joining us today as uh, speakers. It's been wonderful. Thanks very much. And I'll be Thank sharing you, my, my links to my maps as uh, one way or another as a medium post or something and, and in the chat sessions. Thank you. Thank you.